So I'm really, truly honored uh, to be standing here in front of you today. Sorry. And Sorry. Sorry on the screen. what was that? Oh, we're not, we're not actually showing anything. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna let. Thank you. But I'm still honored. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, while we're fixing this, I, I just want to say, what I'm honored about is um, that you know, I, I'm speaking a lot around the country, and. Um, I, I'm going to admit to you that I actually just looked at the actual title of this conference, and now I don't have any. Thing. Oh, oh, oh! We're having tech, technical difficulties, but we're getting there. Um, health and spirituality. Um, I really have to say, and again, it's really great that Betty's here because even though I've been practicing palliative care now for how many years? About ten years, I think. Yes, ten years exactly. Two thousand eight. Um, and I've been working with Betty since that, for that whole time. It's really taken me, I'd say, far too long to understand the deeply important piece of the spirituality attention that a palliative care team brings. And I really have been speaking, uh, I was just going to tell you that I was in New York City a few days ago speaking at a, an interfaith um, meeting um, at the Jewish Theological Seminary about how faith communities should think about the end of life and think about preparing for the end of life. And, you know, I, I realized that, I, and I admitted to this large group that it's an embarrassingly late realization for me uh, to understand that, that the physical attention to suffering, which is part of what a palliative care team does, is really only one small part. I used to think it was the primary piece, and I'm actually realizing as I watch Betty, and as I learn myself how to provide more spiritual attention, uh, how critically important this is, and frankly, if not more important than the physical um, attention that we bring as a palliative care team. So, now, what I want to do is talk to you today, specifically, about the history and context of how we have developed the situation that we're in right now, which is what brings you all here together, which is a lot of suffering and a very non-human focused approach to caring for patients at the end of life. Why? Well, people, as we know, are dying very poorly in America, even though there is this rising movement to combat that. And their families are suffering. And the healthcare providers attending to them are suffering too, and are in great moral distress. And I am one of those, which is what brings me to this movement myself. So, you know, I went into medicine to be like these guys and some gals. They were heroic. They were lifesavers. There was really nothing mundane about them. There was always something else that they could try or do to save the day, something to whip out of their toolbox. And that's how I found myself in the spring of 2003, so let's go back to 2003, preparing to place this catheter into a patient's neck. Now I was a new attending physician in the intensive care unit at a hospital in inner city Newark, New Jersey. And I was in the middle of the action, it was a trauma, level one trauma center, and I loved it. And I had this patient in bed five, and she was 54 years old, she had metastatic breast cancer. And she was going into renal failure, and she had profound acidosis in her blood. She had a rising potassium level. It was getting very dangerous. And the primary team asked if I could go and put this dialysis catheter in so that they could do dialysis on this patient. And it made perfect sense physiologically to me. So we drew some coagulation studies to make sure she wouldn't bleed too much when we put the line in. I sat with the husband and I went through the consent form and I explained all of the risks and benefits of these procedures and how we would attend to each one. He signed it and nervously went off to the waiting room. Set up the patient, got her neck sterilized, drew up the lidocaine, put the drapes over her, big sea of blue in the room. I flushed the catheter, I checked the balloon, I gowned and gloved, and I laid out this really big blue drape and I put all my stuff the nurse was waiting, she had primed all the tubes and was ready to connect it as soon as I got that quitting catheter into the neck. I turned the patient's head to the left, to the, I'm trying to remember which side was I doing it, to the left so that I could get a better look at the IJ. 
and all systems were go. And I asked the nurse to put the patient into Trendelenburg so that her head was below the rest of her body and we could have more pressure in and I would make sure I had more of a chance of getting into the vein. And I got ready to insert the needle. But suddenly, I noticed someone watching me from the doorway. And it was Pat Murphy. Um, for those of you who might have seen Extremis, you hear me talk about Pat in the movie. Pat was, and is, she's now retired, an advanced practice nurse who ran the new, this was 2003 again, before palliative care was a, an official subspecialty in the American Board of Internal Medicine. Pat ran what was called the Family Support Team at this hospital. I didn't really know what they did or who they were, but suddenly they were always sort of looking over my shoulder, writing things down on their paper, telling me that maybe I hadn't communicated something well enough I took what they said with a grain of salt. I thought I was pretty good at communicating. And now, I'm looking over and Pat looks furious. And she is standing there and she takes her hand and she puts it up to her face like it's a pretend felt telephone. And she says, 911, call the police. They're torturing a patient in the ICU. Now, I knew that it was a pretend phone, but somehow I was really shaken. Oh my God, am I in trouble? I had visions of losing my license. I just got scared. Something felt very ominous to me. But then I realized the police were not coming, and I wasn't even in trouble, except with myself because I was really, really uncomfortable with what I was about to do. And if I was really honest with myself, I realized that I'd actually been uncomfortable with this for the past eight years that I've been training in medical school, residency. And suddenly this light bulb went off and I realized the patient is dying. I knew that and frankly, so did the rest of the teams. This catheter was not gonna help this woman. And Frank, it was actually gonna hurt her. It was already hurting her. She was lying with her head tilted down, moaning under this blanket, under this, this sheet that I had over her face. Her husband, her biggest supporter, was out of the room, in the waiting room, not able to be next to her. And on top of that, and probably most importantly, I wouldn't have wanted that for myself. None of it made sense. What the heck was I doing? But there were so many pressures that were pressing me to keep going to do this line. The nurse had set up the tubing and she had primed it and she was standing there waiting for me so that she could connect it and that they could bring the dialysis machine in. The husband, as I've mentioned, was in the waiting room. He was expecting me to help his wife. He was terrified. I had told him I was gonna help his wife. The primary team had already arranged for the patient to be put at the top of the list to get dialysis. They had pulled this dialysis machine. They had bumped a lot of other people off the list for emergent dialysis for this patient. And my medical students needed to learn how to do this procedure. And they were eager and gowned and ready to go. And of course, don't forget medical culture. Acknowledging or even talking about death feels like a failure. And most importantly, me. I wanted to help. I wanted to do something to help this dreadful, sad situation. And this is all that I knew how to do. So it all translated into do the line. And so I did. And now I will tell you, as I am sure none of you in this room are surprised to hear, that that line did not improve my patient's life. She died the next day. But it changed mine. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not against medical technology. I have saved many lives with it. I have sent people 
back to their families, snatched people from the jaws of death. I mean, remember the iron lung? Most of you are too young to really remember it, but let's talk about miracles, right? In the 1940s, thousands, I'm not even sure if it was hundreds of thousands, but certainly tens of thousands of young people who would have died if not for this machine. And by the way, I don't know if you know that this was created, I think, in 1928 from two engineers at the Harvard School of Public Health, I believe. They pulled a machine out of a vacuum cleaner and they just engineered this thing to reverse suction and to create this, this negative pressure chamber that would inflate people's lungs rhythmically. And they really, it was lucky that they had created it because then when the polio epidemic came along, it saved all of these young people. They went back to live their lives, normal lives. My Auntie Fanny lived until she was 85 years old. She, had, she would have died for, if not for the iron lung. Same time in the battlefields of World War II in Korea, they were learning how to use, doctors were learning how to use technology and catheters to save lives of soldiers on the battlefield. They would actually bring these shacks, uh, temporary shacks, 10 miles within the fighting, and they would scoop soldiers who were hemorrhaging, who were in septic shock, and they would bring them back to these shacks, and they would resuscitate them. And many of those soldiers, again, unprecedented, went back to live their lives. Something extraordinary was happening. Recently, think about this, this is the 30s and 40s and 50s. It was heroic. You know, doctors were suddenly able to intervene with machines and other types of aggressive technologies to restore life that would absolutely have been lost of children, of soldiers. Doctors were becoming highly skilled at managing blood pressure and resuscitating dying bodies. Now, mechanical support for breathing and pharmacologic support for blood pressure and catheters and all of those things these activities require very skilled levels of practice and training. They also require space. These machines are big. The intensive care unit was born. And in 1958, Johns Hopkins, first ICU, was really started. And by 10 years after that, Almost every hospital in the intensive care in the entire United States had an intensive care unit. And by 2015, more than 6,000 ICUs are accounted for by 5,000 hospitals. And that growth continues. According to the American Hospital Association's 2014 survey, almost one out of every nine hospital beds is an ICU bed. And that's an increase of 15% from 2006, between 2006 and 2014. Now there's a veritable vegetable soup of options. Like ICUs are spawning. You know, there's the neuro ICU, the SICU, the PICU. Each one has its own set of technological expertise, its own interventions and protocols, its own very super specialized physicians who practice in them. What started with a respiratory focus has now expanded into cardiac surgery, neonatal, pediatrics. For goodness sake, there's even a digestive diseases ICU in the Medical University of South Carolina. I had never heard of that before. But they all have a common theme. They all center, and actually new ICUs that are being built now have actually got this column it's a utility column, which sits in the center of the ICU, which shows what the high focus of an ICU is about. It's about this technologic utility column. In those utility columns, which you can see on the left side of this picture, in, there runs suction, oxygen, compressed air, and a whole lot of other types of things that one might need to use for a patient who might deteriorate physiologically. And by the way, the bed just slips right in next to this utility column and plugs into place. And there's power strips and all sorts of things. In some ways, it kind of reminds me of a conveyor belt. 
which is what? It's an automatic, repeated set of processes that move towards a predictable goal. You know, Henry Ford, his goal was making cars more efficiently, and they churned out a lot of Model Ts. <coughs> and the ICU, the goal is to improve organ function, to fight disease, and ultimately to prolong life. And now for a person who might get better, you want this rapid fire invasive treatment. But for those who won't, those who are dying, the experience becomes what I call the end of life conveyor belt. And this is a belt that's destiny and goal is to prop up organs as they fail sequentially as a patient begins to die. It's something that traps the dying on machines, most of whom will never regain enough strength to again live independently of those machines. And as my training and early career went along, I realized that I was seeing this too often and that I was actually a participant in this conveyor belt. Now the patient in bed five was my turning point. Now if I'd been working, anybody ever hear about this idea of stop the line on the Toyota? Yeah, okay, I see some heads. If I'd been working at Toyota, I would have been <laughs> commanded, the culture there would have commanded me to stop the line if I saw something that was giving me doubts or that was potentially compromising quality. It's an actual button on most of these conveyor belts that is meant for anybody in that factory to stop that line. And it actually, that particular philosophy, that approach, is what is responsible for that industry's extremely low rate of defects and mistakes. But what better place to avoid mistakes than when treating the most vulnerable of our population? Now, 15 years ago, we didn't think that way in the ICU. We didn't think about stopping the line. And even though I was the attending in that ICU, and I had the power to do whatever I thought was appropriate, I didn't know there was an off button. Now, I was not alone in my suspicions, my growing suspicions that something was off. About seven years before this experience that I had, in 1996, the support trial was published. How many people have heard of the support trial in this room? I'm suspecting quite a few. Okay. This trial was run in five centers, five sites in the United States. It happened by total coincidence that one of those sites was Case Western Reserve University, where I was a medical student at the time. The authors of the study had been having the same concerns and suspicions that I was that were percolating in my head. That People weren't dying well in this country. And this study, which I want you to understand know about, because it was a sentinel study, it was a really important study, it, went, it was conducted in two phases. There were almost 10,000 patients who were looked at. They were all patients with very serious prognoses, and, a serious illness, and a prognosis of less than six months. Sorry, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. It was done in two phases. The first phase was essentially, let's, let's assess what's going on. Let's look at these people, this large cohort of people. Let's look at the deaths and let's understand how people are dying. And once that determination was made, the second phase was intended to intervene and do something different to try to improve it. I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert. It wasn't good on either account. First of all, phase one showed us 1,150 deaths, by the way, were included in this. They looked at 1,150 1, deaths over six months of this study, and they found these patients who died had suffered from very poor communication with their physicians. Of 31 patients who had clearly expressed to the study team that they wanted a DNR status for their code, for their code status, only 47% of their physicians knew that. They had what was considered very over-medicalized, over-technologized deaths. The median stay of those 1,150 patients was in the ICU, the median ICU stay was eight days. 
Almost 40% were in the ICU for more than 10 days before they died. And there was significant patient suffering, certainly even just pain. 50% of conscious patients, of the conscious patients, died in pain. Now phase two, this interventional piece, the intervention was they had serious, serious communication with those patients using social workers, psychologists to talk about their preferences and values. And then they fed this information back to the physicians caring for these patients. They gave them a huge amount of information about who these patients were, what they cared about. No change in any of the measures that we saw. It didn't help. And disturbingly, these conveyor belt deaths are continuing to rise to this day. Joan Tino, who's a very well-regarded healthcare researcher, looked at, has been studying large, large cohorts of Medicare data since 2000. And she found that in 2005, 24% of patients were living or dying in the ICU or recent, just very recently discharged. And that number has risen to almost 30% in 2015. That was just published uh, within the past few months. What is going on? The support trial's been around for more than 20 years. We know that people are suffering. It's expensive. Why haven't we done anything about it? Why is it getting worse? Well, because it's complicated. <laughs> it's very complicated. It's a multifactorial, multifactorial problem, and it's very complicated to solve. But I've taken a stab. It's a non-inclusive list, and I'm just going to march you through some of the things that I think are contributing. First of all, planning. Planning is the key to any outcome, right? Any good outcome should be planned for, especially one as existential as death and important as death. But we're not planning. Most people arrive in hospitals and ICUs without ever having discussed their preferences for treatment with their family, with their doctors. Why aren't we planning? Because you can't plan for a good death if you don't know you're dying. And a lot of people have no idea that they're dying. OK, so why? Why don't we know that we're dying? Why is communication so off? between patients and physicians. Many, many complicated reasons. This is not the first, not the last. It's one of them. Human beings tend to avoid difficult conversations, not just about death, but about everything. Doctors and patients alike. Show of hands. Who here has really talked to your family the way you think you should, to the level and depth that you think you should? about your end of life wishes. Well, OK, that's what I figured. <laughs> Not a very fair sample size. <laughs> OK, you're an unusual group. Let's just face it. This is selection bias at work. <laughs> Talking about difficult things is hard, right? It's messy. It's confusing. It's sad. And on top of that, for doctors, it makes us feel like we failed. even doctors, wants to be liked. Imagine, you're in the hospital and you're really, really worried, okay? And a doctor comes up and says, hey, I'm sorry, there are no further treatments that I have for this disease. But then another one, we call him or her Dr. Wonderful, comes around the corner and says, okay, we can try this or we can try that and see how it goes. Well, who would you gravitate towards? I mean, that's obviously a, simple, a way oversimplified version of the issue. But you can imagine, this 2015 study from Tanko in JAMA Oncology asked patients to observe two videos and rate the doctors in these videos on likability. One doctor, by the way, it says doctors in quotes because these were actors. One doctor had optimistic news. 
The other one had pessimistic news. And they controlled this very, very well. They controlled for empathy and gestures and all sorts of things. You guessed it. You know, the optimistic doctors were considered much more compassionate and much more trustworthy. So combine this reality with our collective tendency to avoid bad news. And you can imagine why so communication, sub substantive communication is having such a hard time. Time, okay, I don't know, how many, how many physicians in this group? Okay, not that many, okay. Another major impediment to transferring information is lack of time. And I want to tell you a quick story. It was during my pulmonary fellowship. It was 4 p.m. And I went to the waiting room to get my next patient. I still had two others behind her. And I was pregnant and exhausted. And this woman was an elderly woman with horrific end-stage emphysema. She was on home oxygen, and she'd been very sick. She'd had multiple hospitalizations. And this was my first time meeting her. She was very frail. She couldn't walk more than about 30 steps without needing to sit down in a chair. So we were carrying a chair behind us to get to the, waiting, to the examining room. She was so pleased to meet me and so happy to be alive, she said. She was one of the most compliant patients I've ever met. She did everything her doctor told her, and she was absolutely convinced that she was going to keep things going. In fact, she had a plan to go and visit her daughter on the East Coast who was going to be having another baby. This woman couldn't fly. I didn't even know if this woman could really leave the house or if we should start arranging home visits for her. We needed to talk. I needed to find out about her code stat. I needed to find out if she wanted to be ventilated if she went into respiratory failure. But I didn't have time. So I made an appointment for her to come back as quickly as I could. It was about 10 days later. But I got a call the next week from my co-fellow. And she was, as you would expect, intubated in the ICU. And she never got off that ventilator. So time is a very big problem. And the infrastructure of most practices does not allow for us to really take the time that we need. Nor, by the way, does it provide for the team approach to having this conversation. Because should it really just be the doctors anyways? No. So infrastructure, including time, is a big problem. Skills. They don't call these things difficult conversations for nothing. They require skill, which honestly isn't prioritized in most training programs. And skills are really only learned if they are valued and taught with rigor and practiced over and over the way we practice our code protocols, the way we practice putting in our Quinton catheters. So these are just some of the reasons that patients aren't getting the information that they need and deserve. But there's other contributing factors to this serious public health crisis of bad dying in America. For example, the more is better phenomenon. Has anyone here heard the term the therapeutic illusion? This was coined in the 1940s by a philosopher who basically said, if we have technology, we feel we must use it. He was referring to the atom bomb at the time, or the hydrogen bomb. I think it was the atom bomb. We tend to believe, both patients and doctors, that more must be better, that it just has to work. And actually, as you can see, this very excellent, um, I would recommend, article by uh, David Kassarit in the New England Journal in 2016 is something to read. But again, this tendency to infer causality where none exists. Another, this is where the title All That Glitters comes from this talk. Look at that. It's like a TV dinner. It's so satisfying. It's really, you rip it open, you unfold it, it's neat, it's orderly. There's a series of steps that anyone can learn with a little bit of practice. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end to how to do this procedure. 
Communicating difficult news, very different. Getting yourself to start is already difficult, but you have no idea where things are gonna go. We're talking about human beings and emotions and family systems and all sorts of stuff that I know many of you here at a live hospice already know about. It's a lot easier to clean up from doing a procedure than from talking honestly with a patient. You know, needles go in the needle box and the drapes go in the trash. It's really unlike the emotional, the ethical, and the psychological messes that you can sometimes create by opening up and bringing bad news to people. What would you choose? This slide really deserves its own lecture, so I'm not going to spend much more time, but <coughs> procedures just pay a lot more than telling someone that they're going to die soon. That's just the reality. In summary, it, it seems logical, I hope, and I know because of who this audience is, that the scales are stacked towards intervening rather than talking. And the data shows us that we're right. It's downright chilling. The next slide that I'm about to show you shows data about patients who were about to receive a trach for prolonged intubations in the ICU. And it looked at the difference between what their physicians thought was going to happen to them over the next year and what their loved ones, their surrogates, thought was going to happen. Would they be alive? Would they have a good quality of life? Would they be living independently? The loved ones actually thought that they would be doing pretty well. The patients would be doing pretty well. The physicians thought otherwise. And when I show you this graphic, you'll see that it really doesn't need to be described. 93 to 43%, you know, 71 to 6%. The doctors were much more accurate in their prognostication, but it was the loved ones who were entrusted to make a decision about the surgery that often remains permanent and honestly is one of the first steps on the end-of-life conveyor belt. It's almost impossible, once you've been traked, to get off the end-of-life conveyor belt. Not physically, but emotionally. You've invested in that emotionally. You've taken the risk of a surgery. It's a hard thing to change. Doctors, we need to be telling our patients the truth. Again, they cannot plan for a good death if they don't know they're dying. Now, in this study, only 8% of the patients in this geriatrics practice had ever discussed code status with their doctors. 8%. But doctors who know the most about what happens in our hospital and ICU are functioning with a very, very different set of information. In this study from Stanford, looking at doctors' attitudes about using life-prolonging technology on themselves if they were terminally ill, they don't want it. 88% of them said, I'm going to be DNR if I'm terminally ill or frail. So think about that. 8% of the geriatrics patients are even having that conversation. 88% of doctors are saying, uh-uh, no way. This is an ICU nurse who I actually saw. <laughs> Unbelievable. I met her, I heard her talking at, at this conference that I went to at UCSF called Mindfulness in the ICU. And I heard her saying to someone, they're not getting me, I've got a tattoo. <laughs> I was like, really? And I had to take a picture of it because I couldn't believe it. Now. <laughs> You know, most people, a lot of people threaten that they're going to do it, but most people won't do it. Here's the thing. Healthcare providers know something that our patients don't know. And we aren't giving them the chance that we have to opt out of these default high technology interventions. But there's another way. One that I learned from Pat, one that I learned from Benny, one that I've learned from the palliative care movement. Now, as you all know, one of the main aims and focuses of palliative care practitioners and palliative care practices is to enhance communication, right, between the healthcare team and the patient family unit. And not just the facts and the, de the data and the consent forms, but the real stuff, the existential stuff, the psychological stuff, and the emotions that come with it. And what we know, after two decades of information data from the palliative care movement, is that this stuff works.
How does it work? Intervening with communication tends to decrease interventions with life-prolonging technologies with no significant impact on mortality. Here's a study that demonstrates a dramatic reduction in ICU usage for patients who received a proactive palliative care consultation, again, with no change in their 30-day mortality. 191 terminally ill patients, 65 of those got usual care, usual ICU care, and the other 126 got a proactive palliative care consult. And those who got the palliative care consult spent about half the time in the ICU with the same mortality. And this other study that was done in the, uh, in the UCSF um, intensive care unit looked at how decisions are made with changing levels, changing levels of the quality of communication. They have actually a thing called the quality of communication scale. And they found that when the surrogates of ventilated patients in the ICU were talked to and given different quality levels of information, the higher levels, the higher quality co communication resulted in a lower amount of ventilation time. So for every five point increase in the quality of communication score, a 12% shorter time on life sustaining treatment. And these were all patients who ended up dying in the ICU or in the hospital, so it didn't again change mortality. So, by the way, this communication was not received by a palliative care team, it was received by the ICU team. So this is not just a palliative care skill, this is a skill that every doctor, every nurse, every healthcare practitioner must start to cultivate. And this last study I'm going to show you is an old favorite from the New England Journal in 1994. We think of, of C, what, where do we see CPR? We see it on Grey's Anatomy. And we see it in ER on the show, and it works. And so like, yeah, sure, do it, right? This study looked at the desire or willingness to receive CPR before and after understanding what CPR is. And basically, they like it before they know what it is, and after they find out what it is and are clarified, they actually are half as likely to want to have it. So I'm gonna finish up with a story. Okay. I was in New Jersey, we were on vacation with my family, several summers ago. A friend of a friend had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and I knew about this. I'd been tracking this story for a long time. This man was a very powerful, very smart man, very sort of well-regarded businessman, successful. And he was fighting this pancreatic cancer with everything he had. He had an A-team. He called it the A-team at a very prestigious cancer treatment center in New York City, which shall remain nameless. <laughs> I had been recommending that they get palliative care input for a long time, because it was a pretty serious situation. And I knew that palliative care accompanying his chemotherapy would be a good idea. But no, they would have none of it. But on this day, on my vacation, I was called by my friend saying, Jess, you've got to help us. This, he is completely delirious. He is in horrible pain. He's urinating all over the house. He's screaming. His wife is in a panic. What can you do? Can you help? So I got on the phone and I called her. It was sounding dreadful. So I told her, you've got to call. You've got to call 911. You've got to. She said, No, I can't. I can't. He's supposed to go to get his next round of chemotherapy on Monday, and he can't. He will kill me if he's in the hospital and he can't get the chemotherapy. So I drove over to the house. And when I saw him, he was so delirious and in so much pain and so frail and fragile and cachectic beyond recognition that I felt he needed hospice services to manage his symptoms, which I had been talking about, certainly in the form of palliative care for a long time. When I said this to the wife, she looked at me with a combination of being aghast and being insulted and being frightened. 
She said, we're not ready for hospice. We're taking him for his next round of chemotherapy on Monday. He would be devastated. By the way, he was delirious. He couldn't even talk to me. I said, I, 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 said, I can't imagine him being able to go to the kitchen, let alone New York City, let alone receive chemotherapy. He's too sick. I suggested that we call the oncologist, this A-team oncologist. Surely, if he understood from another physician the state that this patient was in physiologically, he would agree that at least for now, chemotherapy should be put on hold and hospice services would be appropriate. She was terrified. She said, I think he's gonna feel like we're giving up. But she agreed to let me call and put him on speakerphone. And she stood in the back of the room like this because she felt that she was about to get abandoned by their A-team player. She was terrified. So I said to this doctor, I really, this is the situation, this is what's happening. Um, he said, well, I really would like to understand why his LFTs are elevating and I'm not really sure that I understand exactly physiologically what's going on. I said, wait a minute. I said, right now, this man is profoundly delirious and profoundly ill. And I said, do you think that hospice would be appropriate? He said, no, I, I really think we need to figure out this and that. I said, okay, wait a minute, I have a question for you. How would you feel if we tried hospice for a short period of time and if he got better, you've all heard this, right? If he got better, we can then go and do some more chemotherapy. That euphemistic, if he gets better, we can then. And the doctor who is on speakerphone said, well, that's not gonna happen. And the wife was right there. <laughs> She's, he's not gonna get better. So here he is with this whole treatment plan and more chemotherapy and no hospice, telling all of us he's not getting better. The wife was flabbergasted. She, she couldn't believe it. I mean, I could because Unfortunately, and I know many of you too, have seen this many, many times. We did call in hospice that day. They focused on his symptoms and he very quickly, his delirium was resolved. He was calm, comfortable. And two days later, he died in his bed with his wife lying next to him, listening to classical music, very comfortable. This story is emblematic of what we're seeing in the data. That when people do get honest information from their doctors, in whatever form, sensitive or not, they tend to want less technology and less intervention. So, in summarizing, technology should be used not as an end in and of itself, but as a means to an end. Let's not hide behind our technologies, our drugs, our stethoscopes, our catheters, our ventilators. Honest communication is one of the most important interventions we have to offer. Our patients deserve the best information in order to make the best choices. And saving life is important but so is saving the patient from an end that she might not have wanted. So, in summary, thank you all for being here. It is wonderful to be among like-minded people. We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do, but we can do it. And I think I'm seeing things change and I hope that all of you are too. So thank you so much. Doctors that are another round of applause. It's always really, really interesting for me as someone who does a little bit of education in the community to be able to hear someone explain hospice use and hospice services and helping patients at the end of life in an effective way. Um, a lot of times we have a lot of experts that will speak to you, but they'll speak to you in expert language, which is way over here. 
and, you, and you're trying to reach for the words, mm -hmm. but be able to speak directly to a multidisciplinary crowd. Um, I really appreciate that. And so we're going to move into a, a few minutes of question and answer about 10, 12 minutes, and then we'll, uh, Dr. Zitter will also be available outside uh, with Parnassus Books for a book signing. So we're going to go ahead and move into Q&A. I've got some mics for the audience, so you won't have to come up or anything. like Phil, the Phil Donahue show. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Zinner. I'm very excited to hear from you today. Uh, I haven't read your book, but I've seen extremists and have shown it to my students a number of times. So I just want to make a quick comment that um, I think that the film is really interesting and exciting. And it, it, to me, it helps to fill me with optimism because I think it's part of what I see that I perceive as breaking down taboos about addressing these tough questions. So my question for you is, is it right to be optimistic? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. That's a hard question. Well, I ended it saying I was being optimistic, didn't I? I have to stick with that. <laughs> I'm optimistic. I'll tell you why. You know what? I started writing about this stuff in 2013, and there was no one else writing about it. And there wasn't a grassroots movement of interest in it. There is change, and it's happening. Change just happens slowly. You know, to change this, we have a lot of institutionalized stuff that we're going to have to address, honestly, and open. You know, first, just start with the hierarchy in the hospital. Hospitals are the most hierarchical places around. I don't know, maybe, there's, I guess everything's hierarchical, right? But the thing about a palliative care team, and palliative care is gaining in, 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 in its tribe members and its interest and its popularity and it, rapidly. I mean, it really, I didn't know about, no one knew about it in 2003. 2008 became a subspecialty, it was this tiny little thing. You look at the membership of the AAHPM, the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, Every year, the annual meeting just like, I don't know, triples or quadruples in number. There are a lot of foot soldiers out there doing this work. And the palliative care movement, which Bet oh, Betty, Betty and I work together as colleagues, that is a model that I like. I like that model, and it is just gaining prominence. People are seeing it where people work together. Chaplains are teaching doctors, doctors are teaching chaplains, social workers, you know. It's a totally new model for the, for the healthcare world, and it's a model that has to start to stick. And I do think that in some places, I was just at Mass General yesterday speaking, and they are doing some great, groundbreaking stuff. They've got a whole crop of fellows, some of them are nurse practitioners, and some of them are doctors, they work like this together. That's new, and that's exciting, and that is a break in the hierarchy, and that's gonna start us going in the right place. So I am optimistic. It's, it's going to be a long slog. A little bit of optimism, a little bit of pessimism. <laughs> you mentioned Perrin Coyle, and, I, and mm. I've heard her speak and, and was, read a lot of the literature. And my own experience has been working with people who face incredible challenges, both from language as well as educational standpoint. And I'm wondering what you think that we can do here locally to help give our patients and their families the power to participate knowingly in the kinds of conversations that we know need to take place. Yeah. Um, I, am, I share your optimism that clinicians are beginning to get and are educating themselves, yeah. but there's this enormous barrier to the people that we're talking to. Yeah. And we, really, we want this to be a partnership, not only between nurses and docs, yeah. and chaplains and social workers, but also all of us and the patient. But that's really tough. What, what more can we do to break down those literacy and numeracy there? Oh, there, and there's so many more barriers, right? I mean, there's race, there's language, there's trust, there's um, financial, there's social variables, there's 
all sorts of things that come into the relationship between the healthcare team and the patient that are going to keep them apart and keep the decision making uh, not pure and what is the best thing for this person. There's so many things that happen. And the only way, here, here's the answer, this is gonna sound trite, but I really think it's ultimately what it comes down to, forming relationships. Now that's, I understand you're talking more on a sort of, you, 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 I think you're talking about more of a, uh, an agency level and talking to larger groups of people. But I, when we talk about, when we take care of our patients in the hospital, it's always about really creating a relationship one-on-one, -on -one, two on one with those people, right? right. Uh, agreed? Hum humanism, humanizing people. Or you, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. It's, good. Yes. it's important to have someone give the family story and then relay that story to the doctors and the social workers. And when people have the story, they begin to understand why the family is feeling the way they're feeling, why they may be fighting against some information, what's really going on, and just the, the understanding makes a big difference in care. I've seen that happen over and over again, and the doctors have thanked me for getting the story mm -hmm. because it changed the way they listened and the way they saw and the way they understood the family and the patient. So true. So, so true. I mean, it's, it's unusual for me to have the chaplain I work with in the room. But yeah, Benny really um, has taught me uh, about that piece of it that, that you know, I, I coming in with my progressive values and I think I often make judgments about people and I often have sort of preconceived notions about what this word means that they said and without asking, without getting to know them. And, and Betty really frequently does that. So, but on a sort of a higher level, agency level, a city level, et cetera, you know, I, I don't know if I have an answer to it yet. Um, I'm thinking about it a lot because I'm actually very concerned and part of what we see in our population is a lot of racial inequities that I, because I take care of patients in public hospital. And that's a big concern to me. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, certainly in Oakland, you know, what are some of the things that we can do? Because as you can imagine, there's, again, so many reasons why it is, you know, you've got a white doctor walking into a room with an African-American patient, and, you know, what's that dynamic already, you know, um, setting up when you're talking, starting to talk about big issues and existence, and there's a lack of trust, et cetera. So how can we sort of serve the African-American community to be more comfortable. One of the things that I have been doing, and Betty is already is very much a part of this, we work, we have something called the Alameda County Care Alliance in, in Oakland that um, is run by a woman named Cynthia Perilliat who brings together, and I'm not sure if you're doing this here in, in, in Nashville, but she has decided that she wants to bring all the clergy of Oakland together, and that's why Betty's involved, to really do sort of in-services on understanding the end-of-life conveyor belt, what's going on in hospitals, all that sort of logistical stuff in advance, obviously upstream before people are in the ICU, so that from trusted sources in the community, people start to learn this stuff and understand it and not have it from somebody in when they're in extremis and it's a white doctor walking into the room where there's already a setup for distrust. Um, so I think that kind of out-of-the-hospital work can be very, very impactful, and that's just something we're starting now, and I think it's, I, I, hope, I have great hopes for it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Angela Volandes has created a lot of the videos that you can use to help people make decisions by showing a short clip of what are the benefits and the burdens of a particular intervention. And, and I find that helpful too as, as well. Yes. Um, just practically, like we, my husband and I, we have a will and everything, but um, practically like you were saying, even if something happens to me today and my whole family knows what I want, just practically, are who are they gonna do what I want? <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm gonna, that's the thing. Like, how do we? But you that's know? what you just said is really important. You said they know what I want, and that's the problem. Is if your doctors aren't giving your family honest information about your prognosis, which, as I have said, is very common, and you'll see it if you watch extremists. Right. 
then your family might know what you want, but they don't know where you are. And so it has to be a combination of exactly the work that you've done, which is really important, advanced care planning. And by the way, advanced care planning shouldn't just be about medical decisions, it should also be about human planning. Like, what kind, when you're dying, do you want to have music? Do you want to have it quiet? You know, who do you want in the room? Who should come? Who should, those things are also important plans that people don't talk about as much. But all that advanced care planning is very, very important. But the communication piece with when you're in the hospital, when you do have a serious illness, Understanding your your different the, the different what if paths and how likely is it that it's going to go this way and how likely is it that it's going to go this way? What is going this way look like? What is an LTAC? What does it look like if I'm going to be living on machines in an LTAC, tied with my arms tied down? For some people, that's acceptable. It is. It's okay, but they need to understand what it is before they make a decision. People need that information, and the problem is that's a real problem is we're not giving it to you. Mm -hmm. I'm saying somebody calls 911 for me right now, and mm -hmm. I'm like, they're gonna give me CPR. I don't want that. How, I mean, is well, there's some way to, you know, just practically what? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Are you, saying, are, you tell, are you saying you personally wouldn't want CPR? I'm not sure that I do. Okay. Well, the, yeah. no, the reason I ask, and not to probe into your private uh, life, but I will tell you something very interesting that's happening that I was talking about with some people. Everyone here, I'm assuming most people have heard of a post form. Anybody not heard? Actually, don't be embarrassed. Has anyone not heard of a post form? Okay, good. Thank you for saying that. So let me tell you, do you use polls in, in Tennessee? Yes. We're in Tennessee, right? <laughs> Where am I? Okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry. I'm a little tired these days, too much traveling. A post form is called a physician order for life sustaining treatment. And it's an actual physician order. It's signed by a physician. And <clears throat> it is essentially meant for, it's meant for everybody. It's meant for ER physicians, first responders, paramedics, ER, anybody who sees you once 911's been called or once you've gotten swept into the hospital. And it is a form that says, essentially, you don't need to use it if you want everything done, because we will do that. That's what we do by default. If you are someone who says, I don't want certain types of life prolonging treatment, you should fill out this form, because it is a legal doctor's order that basically would make it assault and battery if something was done that you had signed that you didn't want done. The thing that I'm finding, that I find very interesting about the POLST form, is that, and I'm actually on the National POLST Form Revision Project. I'm one of the consultants on it. And the POLST form is a very important protection for people who do not want certain types of interventions because they will happen by default, as, as I've explained, the end-of-life conveyor belt. They just happen. The problem I'm seeing is that there's so many people apropos of our optimism about the rise of the grassroots movement of dying better and everyone, people are filling out polls forms who are young and healthy. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, do you understand what that means? The polls form is intended for people who have life-limiting illness. People whose quality of life, if they were to have something happen to them, could never be back to a level that would be acceptable to them. It's not meant for people for whom recovery or re return to a quality of, li quality of life, likely return to a uh, uh, quality of life would be acceptable to them. It's not meant for those people. It's only really meant for people who are frail, dying, terminally ill, and who decide they wouldn't want those things. Many people who are frail, elderly and terminally ill still would want to be resuscitated. That's as long as they understand what it looks like, as long as they understand what a long-term acute care facility and a ventilator facility look like, I support it. Most people don't. But what I'm noticing is more and more people who are young and healthy and aren't necessarily the intended audience for a post form are saying, I got my post form. And I'm thinking, wait, I don't know that you totally understand. So I, that's an interesting phenomenon that's happening. And we've got time for one last question right here. Hmm? Or right here. Oh. Right here. Orange sweater. Was that orange? I can't see. <laughs> Candy corn. 
Hi, Dr. Glitter. Um, I am uh, an ICU nurse in the cardiothoracic surgery unit. Um, and I'm very familiar with, your book really spoke to me um, as someone who's very familiar with sort of the conveyor belt of treatment. Um, and as a nurse, um, I work so closely with patients who go in for surgeries, um, who have trusted their doctors with their lives, and who have hoped for the best. And often, or sometimes, um, complications make it such that that's just not possible. Um, and when I read your book, I was just so very struck, having witnessed um, a lot of what you described, uh, the amount of courage that it must have taken for you to just start this whole process, mm -hmm. and, and professional courage is kind of what I'm talking about. As a nurse, you know, there's a hierarchy, and the doctors really direct the, treat, the treatment, and um, I know a lot of us as interdisciplinary uh, professionals don't feel the same authority that physicians have, and to speak up and to really challenge a treatment plan and to pull the line, stop the line, um, does take a tremendous amount of courage um, because you really are saying, you know, I know enough to say maybe we should not be doing this or, you know, sometimes it's seen as going behind the physician's back, um, talking with the patient. You know, we deal with a lot of, you know, hierarchical issues, you know, sort of below the physician level. But even I think, you know, as I observe, you know, residents and fellows who all have to deal with that hierarchy and attendings who have to deal with folks who have uh, different levels of experience, the amount of courage it takes to really think, say, I know, you know, this is something we should examine. I was just, I was so struck and so, I have so much respect for the amount of courage that you had. Um, and I, I just, I know that just on a day-to-day -day basis to start these conversations and to do this kind of work, it takes courage and you want to think that you have that, but you just don't always because there's so much self-doubt oh. in um, the medical profession no matter what you're doing. Um, I would love to just hear some of your insight in terms of like wow. making those decisions to speak up and to continue to speak up and I don't know, where do you get your courage? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, you have a lot of courage too. First of all, thank you for asking that question. I'm glad Betty's here because Betty has watched me over these. It, you're right. You're right. It's taken courage. I don't think it, it's been very hard. I'm going to be honest with you. It's been very hard, and I actually have been traumatized by it. It's the honest truth. I come into the palliative care office crying <laughs> a lot of times. And um, it's very hard. Some places are harder than others. Some, some environments are more, are less hierarchical. Some environments are more collaborative. Some, some environments uh, make it okay to dissent or to ask or to question. When you, did you see Extremis? Okay. Did you see the scene where I was fighting with Dr. Bargava? Okay. She's a really good friend of mine, by the way. It took us months to get over that. I don't even think we fully processed it. It's not just being at a quote-unquote lower spot on the hierarchy, whether you, you feel that you, you're, you're nursing, you're the ICU nurse and you can't really say, hey, attending, I don't agree with what you're doing. Or you're the resident and you're like, you can't say, hey, attending, I don't. It's not just that kind of courage, because that's real courage. And in some ways, you're sort of in a no-win situation with that, because if a hierarchy is very established in a hospital, what are you going to do really, right? If you're a resident and you, you don't want to be you know, labeled by the attendings who are in charge of your, of your uh, um, evaluations as the troublesome resident who's always, who is this uppity resident, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I'm talking about. But even for me as the attending ICU doctor, it is hard in this environment. I wish you could have been at my talk yesterday at Mass General because I talked all about this. It was all physicians. And I was talking about the courage that it takes for a physician to disagree with another physician. It is very hard because you, in that scene with Dr. Bargava, I was explaining to this group at Mass General yesterday, it was a huge fight. In fact, the, what you see on the film was a reenact, it wasn't a reenactment, it was a continuation. The day before the fight had been so bad, she was angry at me, that we had asked the filmmaker to stop filming. If 
if, if, if you feel that you're being judged by your colleague as I'm giving up, I'm letting Donna die because I'm talking about extubating her and not tracking her. And she felt that I was saying, you're just too aggressive. What kind of an aggressive doctor are you? You know, she knew as well as I do that the Donna was never going to get extubated. That's so deep. This is deep, deep emotional trauma. It's, uh, uh, it's easier just to put your head down and treat the patient. It's just easier because it is really awful. And there's a lot of like, consultation etiquette issues and who owns the patient and, and you've got a film crew behind you. Do you think you're so great? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here that happens, that plays out in hospitals everywhere. And then there's the oncologist talking to the palliative care doctor, and the oncologist is gonna go on in and offer another thing, and the palliative care doctor wants to offer, talk about offering hospice, but they can't do anything until they figure it out if the oncologist is not gonna offer another six, seven, whatever, line treatment. All of this stuff is playing out all the time in our hospitals, and what the problem is, is that we're not collaborative. We're not collaborative either going up and down the line in terms of the professions, you know, doctor, nurse, chapel, whatever. And we're not collaborative even amongst ourselves in, at our different levels because everyone's afraid. There's so much stress, there's so much trauma, and it's so painful to watch people suffering that everyone just wants to do what is gonna cause the least amount of conflict. So I, didn't, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but you're right and you're picking it up, you're picking up the fact it's not just courageous of me, it's all of us who are standing up. I think palliative care and hospice, I actually said this yesterday to somebody, are like a new rebellion against the medical system. It's saying, we can't do this anymore, it's not working, and I'm just so lucky that I found palliative care because I don't know what I would have done if I couldn't have had a rebellion of some sort to, to, to to express myself because it was just getting so I was creating so much moral distress so long and rambling answer to I hear you and we just need to all be courageous together and just keep moving forward that's my answer so we'll have a few minutes and so um, while Dr. Zitter is signing her books and and to be able to connect for a while. So if you have some questions that you wanted to ask, and maybe not in a public audience, but in a private, or just some other questions to ask, I know there'll be time in order to be able to personally connect. So I wanna say thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, which is crazy and wonderful and everything. You've taken the courage in order to be able to make this a national movement. And I wanna also be able to say selfishly here, for a live hospice in our national community, how proud I am um, when I see the participation in this room, that we have a community of healthcare providers and community members and clergy that are willing to be able to look at this topic differently than where it's been in the past. I'm proud of the fact that Keith leads um, quarterly clergy breakfasts, so you were talking about that, so that we can bring clergy in in smaller intimate groups to be able to talk about these issues and hopefully be able to provide training. I'm proud of the fact from an advocacy-focused perspective that HCA Foundation has teamed up with us to be able to connect with members of our community that don't utilize end-of-life services proportionately to the typical white mm -hmm. Anglo-Saxon American that uses hospice services. So focusing on the African-American communities, focusing on the Hispanic communities, and focusing on the immigrant communities and all the barriers um, culturally um, from a faith perspective and otherwise that go into a fear of this system. Um, I'm proud that we have advanced directive training that we do in our advanced directive in seven steps in the gift initiative. And I'm proud that we have a program that's called SHARE, which is teaching practicing providers how to have these difficult conversations. Because there's nothing about this as fun. And I was talking to somebody one day and I said, you know, we've just got to normalize death. And, but that's from somebody sitting on my side as a business. The reality of it is we will never normalize death when it's somebody you love. And so with that, how do we have a sensitivity? How do we have a passion? How do we have the courage? And so thank you for coming and being a part of us. I hope we can share what we're doing in our community with what you're doing nationally. And just what a privilege and a blessing it is for you to be here with us today. Thank you so much. Oh.